so we, we concluded yesterday's lecture with a sketch of the basic argument for this duality for s 2 n equal 4 superior mirror sketch theory. And I think it's, it's useful to just recall the basic points. So uh, we started by arguing that the gauge coupling tau is an exactly marginal parameter of the theory. So that if all masses are turned off, all expectation values are turned off, this is a super conformal theory with the exact scale invariance. Now, if you still keep your masses to zero, but you give a trace of phi square an expectation value, then uh, this expectation value is the only mass, only dimensionful parameter available. Uh, if you write it as 2a squared, uh, the central charge function, which, has to be di which is dimensionful, has to be proportional to a. So essentially, you end up with a very rigid structure. For the central charge. Now, this tau here, strictly speaking, is the gauge coupling or the abelian gauge theory in the infrared. And you might have wondered uh, if it really coincides with the gauge coupling that you put in the ultraviolet Lagrangian. But it's kind of an ill-defined question because uh, it's a question that depends on your renormalization scheme, for example. And for this specific theory, which is n equal for supersymmetry, it's just very natural to define the UV coupling or your renormalization scheme this way. So you just define it to coincide with the IR coupling uh, on the Coulomb branch when the masses are turned off. And this is natural because when the masses are turned off, this theory has n equal 4 supersymmetry. But if you turn on the mass, it becomes n equal 2. So uh, if, you, if you do your calculations in a supersymmetric invariant way, uh, covariant way, then this is essentially the only thing that you can uh, write. I'm mentioning this, I'm sorry, I keep belaboring this point. It's just that uh, it risks being very confusing for an equal true theories. Uh, because for an equal true theories, there is no such special point. So the relation between, so when you try to define what is the UV coupling of the theory, you get, you might get into some, uh, into some problems. Now, uh, so this shows essentially that the, in the Lagrangian for the infrared decrease of freedom, for the massive decrease of freedom on the Coulomb branch, has an sl 2 z invariant, which is electromagnetic duality. So it acts on the vector A, uh, and it acts on tau, essentially, as tau goes to uh, A tau plus B over C tau plus D. It mixes together the electric and magnetic fields. Now, uh, if you, if you, uh, I said this right, if you, uh, now this by itself is not much of an evidence for an S-duality of the ultraviolet theory, okay? Because here it's just a symmetry of the infrared, or the far infrared uh, spectrum, far infrared Lagrangian. But there is some, uh, the next level of, of approximation for the UV theory is to look at the infrared theory together with the spectrum of BPS massive particles. Because the, those BPS massive particles are some extra stuff, extra degrees of freedom that are coming from the UV theory. So there is, you know, there is a massive W boson because you Higgs as you choose to U1. This is a particle of, half BPS particle of electric charge one and magnetic charge zero. And then if you do a semi-classical calculation, you look at semi-classical uh, half BPS solution, classical half BPS solutions, so the equations of, of motion in the UV, and you quantize them, so, uh, you quantize their zero modes. You, you, you find other particles, magnetic monopoles, and ions, 
which has essentially, which can have essentially any electric and magnetic charge you want, integer, uh, n co-prime. Okay. Uh, notice that this transformation acts on the charge vectors. Uh, let me just make sure that I put the things. So this is the shift of the theta angle. This shifts the electric charge by the magnetic charge. So yes. Okay. So this spectrum, uh, well, it's important to notice that this spectrum is computed at a very weak coupling, but it does not have wall crossing. It's just a little exercise to show that as you vary tau, this for this formula, it never happens the central charge of two such particles align. So if you use the conditions that you've learned from, uh, from Greg's lectures, you can really observe that this spectrum that you computed with coupling should be the same everywhere in the parameter space of couplings. It is a cell choosing invariant. So it presents you with a pretty strong evidence that the original UV theory has this exact SL2C, SL2C symmetry. That this transformation sends the theory back to itself. Although it remixes <coughs> deeply all the degrees of freedoms because, I mean, it's replacing W bosons with magnetic monopoles, for example, on the Coulomb branch. Now, uh, I would like to run the same argument now. Uh, for a different theory, which will be more useful for us, which is SU2 with four flavors. which is the theory with SO8 flavor symmetry. So again, if the mass parameters are turned off, remember the mass parameters sit in a cartan of SO8. The mass parameters are turned off, if the expectation value of phi is turned off, then this theory is supposed to have an exactly marginal UV gauge coupling. Now, Again, if I, keep, if I keep the masses to be zero and I only give expectation value to the ratio of phi squared, um, I guess I should put a square over two over there. Sorry. I mean, the mass of the W boson. <coughs> so there is always this. Uh, uh, unpleasant but unavoidable convention issue that when you work with an N equal four square mills because the matter fields are in their joint, it's kind of natural to say that W boson has charge one, okay? But then you, you need to use a slightly different normalization to make things work. But in theory, with the fundamental, it's natural to say that the fundamental lighter multiplet has charge one and the W boson has charge two. Um, so this works, I believe, with that convention. Anyway, so if you give expectation value only to trace of phi squared, uh, then the central charge function cannot be corrected. I should also take the form Q electric plus tau IR Q magnetic uh, times A. And the theory has duality as well. So the, the far infrared theory, at least when the masses are zero, seems to enjoy as duality. But does the spectrum support that conclusion? So what are the monopoles of this theory? Of course, there is still the W boson, which, as I was saying, has charge, electric charge two and magnetic charge zero. Now there are also the fundamental hypermultiplets. If you remember, I was writing a superpotential on the form QIS, uh, Q tilde, JS, phi, IJ. So when I give expression value to phi, the hypermultiplet become massive. They acquire mass A, 
which is okay because they have electric charge one. Now, we have a sliver symmetry group, which is unbroken if the masses are zero. So why not uh, label this, represent this particle also by the rest of eight representation? There are fundamental hypermultiplets, the original fields in the Lagrangian, and they carried an index, which was a vector of SO8. Now, what happens to monopoles? Well, surely there is a sol classical solution uh, in the Coulomb branch, which is a smooth monopole solution, has Q magnetic equal to one. And uh, in any, in, when Ed, when, uh, in, in Wittgen's lectures, you saw that if you quantize this monopole in the theory with an F equal to zero, you just get one hypermultiplet. There are some, uh, because this breaks half of the sort of charges, there are some Goldstinos, I think two Goldstinos, uh, no, sorry, four Goldstinos. Uh, and uh, you end up with a multiplet of states as you quantize this Goldstinos, which gives you exactly one hypermultiplet plus the, plus the antiparticle. Now, the, if you do the same exercise in a theory with flavors, you find some more zero modes of fermions, which you sort of couldn't have predicted just from supersymmetry alone. You just, you really need to go and, and look at the Dirac equation in the background of the monopole. And if you do that, that exercise, you discover that each hypermultiplet uh, gives you, I mean, the fermions in the hypermultiplet gives you new zero modes. But precisely, there are true NF equal to eight, uh, fermionic zero modes. Let me denote them as psi s for now. They are real fermionic zero modes. And they transform in a vector of SO8. So what happens when you quantize them? To quantize them, you need to assume some anti-commutation relations. They had to be SO8 invariant. So what are these? These are just gamma matrices. So when acting on the on monopole states, uh, these zero modes act as gamma matrices, which means that the monopole states live in spinner representations of your flavor group. Now, there is one more interesting point. These fermion zero modes uh, come from hypermultiplets that, I mean, you say this right. Uh, There is a subtle interaction between the electric charge of the, of the states and the action of these fermionic zero modes. Uh, I mean, roughly, although it's not quite precise, these fermionic zero modes uh, were charged under the gauge group. So they sort of changed the gauge charge, the electric charge of the monopole by one unit when they act on it. So the final conclusion is that the, the dions, which have even electric charge, uh, and write more explicitly. Sit in a positive chirality spinner of SO8. And the dions with electric charge odd sit in a negative chirality spinner of SO8. Okay? Now, besides these particles, there are going to be many more particles with higher magnetic charges. And it's a bit of a pain to try to compute the whole, the whole uh, weakly coupled spectrum. But let's just look at this for now. <coughs> so in particular, suppose that I, so let me draw the, the, the tau plane again. So as tau goes to I infinity, we have a weakly coupled re is the original weakly coupled region. Where we have, the, where the lighter particles are the W boson and the upper multiplets in a vector representation. 
Now suppose I go all the way down to tau equal to zero. So not at the angle, but very strong gauge coupling. So this is a region which under SL to Z as duality would be reached by a tau goes to minus one over tau, which exchanges electric and magnetic charges. So what is this what is what are the light particles of the theory? Well, I didn't give you the whole spectrum, but you definitely know that there is a very light magnetic monopole, and it sits in a spinor representation of the, gate, of the flavor symmetry group. If you go around tau equal to 1, or minus 1, uh, then you can check that one of these dions can become very light. And these dions live in an 8C representation of SO8. So there are at least three regions that look different. Now, if you, if you think a bit more carefully, though, you discover that there is no problem. Because SO8 has a triality symmetry, triality, triality outer automorphism. Which means that these three representations, 8V, 8S, and 8C, can be permuted among themselves by an automorphism of the flavor symmetry group. So uh, a theory with fundamental particles in an 8S is the same, th is the same as a theory with fundamental particles in an 8V up to a relabeling of your flavor currents. So I found that there is some good evidence for this duality, which of course then can be reinforced more and more by looking at the subvariate curve and turning on masses and et cetera, et cetera. But so the basic important fact is that this duality is accompanied by this S weight triality. So you can complete this picture. Uh, there are gonna be other regions uh, of all sorts with HS, HC, or HV. Uh, it's also kind of useful to just draw a fundamental region. So essentially, if you go, if you do tau goes to tau plus two, uh, you, you, you send the theory back, back to itself really without a triality operation. So, um, you can draw some sort of a picture uh, of this sort. So you can uh, identify a fundamental region in upper half plane, hmm? such that every other point outside can be brought back here by an S-duality transformation, which does not affect the flavor, the flavor symmetry group. And here you have these three regions. Uh, sorry. I'm, this side is identified with this side, and this side is identified with this side. Okay. So the, if, you, if you just want to sort of describe the, the parameter space of theories that are indistinguishable, you draw this region inside the half plane and do these identifications. Uh, anyway. Uh, all of this would just to provide you for, with some tools to analyze more complicated theories. Yes. That's right. So SU2, SU3 would then have to go Does not have this picture. Um, I, I, will, I hope to, I will say something about that at the end of the lecture, but the, in that case, the ferrosymmetry is U6, mm -hmm. and there is an s duality transformation which sends, so, which sends the fundamental of SU6, which charge, okay, what are the particles? There's the fundamental of SU6, which charge one, and, the, and, the comp, and this is sent by an s duality to the fundamental of SU6, which charge minus one. But you sort of miss the third duality transformation and then 
vectors identified by cyber, Algerian cyber uh, with something more exotic. So, Yes, with a, it depends. So there are two questions you can answer, you can ask. Uh, you can ask what is the symmetric group of the theory if you ignore the flavor information? Or what is the symmetric group of the theory if you keep the flavor information? So if you ignore the flavor information, then everything is identical to SU2 n equal four. Uh, and uh, you can draw the usual upper half, you know, the usual region in the upper half plane which is the modular region of uh, SL2Z. But if you want to keep the, the flavor information, you get a bigger uh, modular region. And uh, for us, it will be very important to keep the flavor information. So, uh, so from our point of view, the modular space of the SU2 and F equal to four has three cusps. One where you have an eight V particle, one where you have an eight S particle, one where you have an eight C particle. Three will three in a sense there are already three different Lagrangian descriptions of the of the same theory because if you if you really want to keep the flavor of information you just have different looking fields inside. Actually, I wanted to probably erase that blackboard. Yeah. So another thing we did yesterday was to describe a, a very large class of theories labeled by a trivalent graph. So now let's explore, the, let's try to answer the question, do these theories have any useless dualities? So let's start with the simplest theory you can think of, which was the SU2 times SU2 theory. Uh, which we drew this way. So this picture meant that I had two gauge groups. This object represented two fundamentals. This represented a bifundamental, and this represented two fundamentals. All of these fields are really just some fields with three S2 indices and I decide which ones to gauge. And it's a useful picture because it points out what are the flavor symmetries of the theory. So these two fundamentals had an SO4, which is two SU choose. And we call them SU2 A and B. Then there was an SU2 C that was the flavor symmetry of the bifundamental. Because the bifundamental was a real representation. And then there was another SO4. Now, how do we explore the, model, the parameter space of this theory? So this theory has two gauge couplings, tau one, tau two. And naively, the parameter space should be the product of two upper half planes, right? What else could it be? I have two gauge couplings, each is valued in the upper half plane, so the parameter space should be the product of two of them. Now, uh, of course, if I really want to be careful, I cannot just straight plunge into the strong coupling region. Instead, it looks more sensible to first explore the boundaries of, this re of, the, of the parameter space and then go in. Explo to explore the boundaries, I mean that I I should first keep one of the gauge couplings very weak and play around with the other gauge coupling. Now, if this gauge coupling is very weak, this is nothing else than, F, than SU2 and F equal to four with a very weakly gauged favor symmetry group. Okay, 
And for a moment, if this is very, very weakly coupled, I should be able to forget about it. Now, this situation f equal to 4 was just defining some conformal field theory, which happened to have three different Lagrangian descriptions. And nothing should prevent me from just using whatever Lagrangian description is more appropriate, depending on the value of tau 1. Now, uh, clearly, if I want to carry over this information to the original theory, it's very important that I, fall, I keep careful track of what happens to this SU2 subgroup of the flavor group, because it's the one that I want to gauge later. So how does this triality act on these SU2 flavor groups? Well, what are these, these four SU2 flavor groups? I started with SO8 that came about because I had four hypermultiplets. But I, I, I divided them a bit artificially in 2 plus 2. So I won't be able, I, I'm naturally considering an SO4 times SO4 inside SO8. OK? Now, the, this field transformed into an 8V. But 8V is just a 4 plus 4 of each of the SO4s. And what is the vector of SO4? The vector of SO4 is the product of the fundamental representations of the two SU choose inside SO4. So this 4 is nothing else but 2A times 2B. And the other 4 is just 2C times 2 of 2. OK? Now, uh, what happens if I apply triality? I'm exchanging 8V with, say, 8S or 8C. What is a spinner of SO8? A spinner of SO8 is the product of two spinners of SO4 with a projection on positive chirality. And it's a simple exercise to show that it looks like this. OK? So if I try to draw the picture that corresponds to the three S-dual images, three S-dual cusps of SU2 and F equal to 4, I need to draw these pictures. So these pictures are exchanged by triality operations. So precisely, if this is a picture that I had as tau 1 goes to i infinity, this will be the picture that I get, say, for tau 1 goes to 0, or tau 1 goes to 1. Now let's apply this piece of knowledge to this theory. And now I really need a big blackboard. So let's start with our original theory. OK, this is never going to fit in the blackboard, but I need to write smaller. OK, A, B, C, D, E. One and two. So I start. <coughs> so this picture really represents a certain region in parameter space where both gauge couplings are weak. I want to move from that region all the way across another region where I keep this coupling weak and I make this strong. So I, I do the permutations I was drawing before.
So B was with A, here B goes with C, and then there should be another one where B goes to with two. So something like A, C, B, D, and E. Okay. Okay, now that I got here, of course, nothing prevents me from doing the same operations instead on two. So keeping this weakly coupled and making this strongly coupled to explore other regions of the boundary of this parameter space. Um, so now I'm going to get something like AB, I'm not going to move. And here I might get D. Uh, E, C, and E, or A, B, E, uh, D, and C. Okay. Now, very naively, if the moduli space is really the product of the two upper half planes, I should be able to do S duality for this node, and then this, for node one, and then node two, or do it for node two, and then node one, I should get the same result. So let's do it. Um, so suppose that now I do S duality the node two, or here at the node one. Now, I hope that I will do things uh, correctly. Uh, so I'm going to get B and E, A, uh, D, and C. Maybe I should write this was done at the node 1, this was done at the node 2. Now I'm doing it at the node 1. Or I do it here at the node two. So uh, what am I going to get? I'm going to get something like uh, B and E together, then uh, D and uh, A and C I didn't touch. But, oh, oh, this is not the same as this. <coughs> so something was fundamentally wrong with that assumption. So the assumption of the parameter spaces of the two theories was just independent, was wrong. So I just should erase it. So it looks like the question of what is M is actually an interesting question. Now notice, these are related by NS duality. Because if I just leave uh, B, so this B and E are already here, so I do NS duality at this node, I can get CD and A. But What's going on? This is node one, and then becomes node two. This is node two, and then becomes node one. Well, whatever. Uh, I can keep track of the identity of the flavor groups. I surely cannot keep track of the identity of gauge groups. Gauge symmetries are not physical, right? <laughs> so instead of finding a square face, we found a pentagon. So now let me just draw. Find, let me just draw the lines of these dualities. Then at each of these, each of these dualities was part of a of a triality, right? So okay, then this was actually part of a pentagon. Well, uh, I'm not very good at drawing polytopes, but I think you can uh, sort of see that this picture will close. 
Uh, this is one of the regular, semi-regular polytops, so you sort of cut off the tip of, uh, of each corner of a dodecahedron or each corner of an icos icosahedron. So you get uh, something which has uh, 12 pentagons and uh, 20 triangles. Anyway, you get a nice picture that is essentially the, the boundary of your parameter space. And it contains, it's, it's called the permuta, permutahedron, I think. It, con, it essentially represents all the ways you can permute the five flavor symmetries. It has five times, uh, no, five factorial. Uh, well, sorry. It depends, so it depends if you keep, you're right, I was wrong. Uh, there is no distinction between having A, B, or B, A. So that's true. You take the permutations and you divide it by the permutation of these two legs. So divide by four. And as Greg is saying, this is called a sosahedron because uh, more or less represents all the ways of putting parentheses in a product of five objects, I think. Uh, so, okay, we got a nice picture, but what do we do with it? Well, uh, we should try to guess what the modular space is. But before doing that, let's just see what happens to more general theories. But it was at least nice that the whole picture closed nicely. There is a really a self-consistent set of first dualities. So, they, so we, we did as dualities in each individual node and we saw, we saw that they don't quite permute the way we expected them. The true duality groups are not independent. The duality structure is not SL2Z times SL2Z. It's something else. But at least everything was consistent. I could draw a picture, a graph, where all the links were as dualities I could trust. And there was no contradiction. Um, so, Let me leave it this. So what happens to a generic theory T gamma? Hmm? So I have some, tri some trivalent graph. Hmm? And each duality operation reorganizes for the four legs that come out of a segment. It's not difficult to argue that through this basic operation you can relate all possible graphs with the same number of external leaves and loops. The number of loops, number of external leaves never changes. After all, the number of external leaves was the number of flavor groups. And the number of loops G uh, gave you a formula for the dimension of the Coulomb branch of the theory. So uh, those cannot change, but everything else can. So there is really a big moduli space of some four dimensional superconformity theory, which with many, many cusps on the boundary, each looking like the Lagrangian description of some T gamma with G loops and then leaves. Mm -hmm. uh, in this example that you gave, what is the fundamental domain in that picture? Ah, who knows? At the moment, we don't know, right? We just concluded that that picture with the true half, half plane search is just wrong. And uh, that should, be, should become something different, should become uh, the, well, 
Here, I, I was sort of ignoring transformations which would bring me back to the same theory, a sort of tau to tau plus one. Hmm? So I was drawing a certain the structure of a certain parameter space. If you take the universal cover of that, you get something that is the, uh, the which is corresponds to that half plane, meaning that uh, you really consider theories, you really imagine things like tau to tau plus one will bring you somewhere else. Uh, so yeah, in a, in a sense, there are two questions you could ask. What is the parameter space and what is the universal cover? And this is what you would, would generalize the notion of the product of true upper half planes. And this would generalize the notion of a modular region. Now, what could this mg and b? So, what we know is that it has a bunch of charts. In each chart, I have this graph gamma, this trivalent graph gamma. And I have a bunch of coordinates, one for each edge. So each chart looks like the upper region of a product of hot rough planes. But I need to understand, but I want to combine all these charts together through these elementary S duality transformations. There is another S duality that I should keep into, in mind. If I have a closed loop like this, uh, this theory represents SHU n equal 4. And I should keep in mind that there are going to be as, the S dualities of this is true n equal 4 to sending tau to 1 over tau. So I actually have uh, two sort of operations. I have the S duality of S2 n equal to 4 and the S duality of S2 n equal 4. Well, I mean, if you, if you had studied before conformal field theory, or if you remember maybe some, some chapter of Polchinski, uh, you should start, this should start uh, reminding you of Riemann surfaces. <coughs> and on the way you build Riemann surfaces uh, out of uh, elementary blocks. So what I'm trying to say is that instead of looking for an M or trying to build this MGN by hand, I will just observe that there is a very famous modelized space with exactly the correct dimension and exactly the correct properties. So I should just check if it if it's a good candidate to describe this parameter space. This parameter space is a space of, a, the space of complex structures of a Riemann surface of genus G with n punctures. So um, let's try to understand if we can really write down charts in that, param in that parameter space, which are naturally parameterized by the gauge couplings of my theory, of my Lagrangian. So uh, suppose that I have a certain trivalent graph. Let me associate to this graph a bunch of spheres with three points, with three marked points. So out of these spheres, I want to build out uh, a Riemann surface of genus G and then punctures. And there is a pretty natural way to do it. Every time I want to glue together the spheres, to get, in a sense, a Riemann surface, which, is a, which fattens up my trivalent graph. How do I glue spheres together or surfaces together? Well, what, what you can do is to take a local coordinate system around this 
point, it is Mach point. Whereas on local coordinate Z1, which goes to zero at the point. Take another local coordinate system, the coordinate Z2 that goes to zero at this point. And to glue the surface together, I just declare that this equation is satisfied. But Q is a parameter which I'm taking to be rather small. So in the limit where Q goes to zero, this becomes the one Z2 equal to zero, which is just the equation for two separate planes. So the two surfaces are sort of disjoint. They touch, they only touch these points. If I turn on Q, the surfaces start merging together. Now, uh, so this describes, so there is a, a certain patch in parameter space of the Riemann surfaces, which has this coordinate system given by the Q i's. I can really show that this is a coordinate patch, meaning that you have exactly 3n, 3g minus 3 plus n qi's. And 3g minus 3 plus n is the dimension of the moduli space of complex structures of a surface. So this gives you locally a chart. And as the qi's go to zero, you get to a limit where this Riemann surface is degenerating has very, very long tubes, long thin tubes, joining the uh, three puncture spheres. Now, I'm ready to write down my chart. I just claim that the QIs are e to the uh, i pi tau i. So I engineered this map so that the basic shift of that angle leaves QI invariant. Okay, that's it. So this is my prescription. And now we need to see if it makes sense. So in particular, we need to try, we need to see if it makes sense for, for the basic S duality transformation, which is S duality of S2 and F equal to four. So I want to see if the transformation of charts that go from glue, gluing the spheres this way with parameter Q and gluing the spheres this way. Ah, notice, sorry, I, I say the, the modular space of the surface G with n points, and I'm really keeping the points marked. So these are marked points. Every point is marked by a flavor symmetry group of the theory. Uh, So I can try to glue two spheres this way or this way with parameters Q and Q prime in order to represent a C2 and F equal to four, uh, two patches in the parameter space of a C2 and F equal to four. So which Riemann surface do I make when I do this gluing? Well. just a sphere with four punctures. Now let me take a, now he, notice here I was a little bit ambiguous. I told you pick this coordinate system, but you have picked slightly different coordinate systems. Uh, this would give you, would give you a slightly different uh, definition of your coordinate patch, but uh, we'll come back on that, to that, on that later. For now let me just pick a, a simple possibility. So suppose I put my punctures at zero, one, infinity, zero, one, infinity, okay? So here I have a coordinate. So I, I, I picked a global coordinate on the sphere. I just identified the sphere with the complex plane. The point at infinity is this point and zero I mean, the local coordinate around zero is just z itself. 
Here I can write another, take another global coordinate w, and a local coordinate around infinity is just 1 over w. So the way I was gluing things together is just z over w equal to q, which means that I have a four puncture sphere parametrized still by uh, w as a point at 0, point at 1. This point was at 1 in z, so is it, uh, sorry, I'm using the coordinate z. This point was at 1 in w, it means that it's a q in the z coordinate. And then there is a point at 1 and a point at infinity. So when I glue things this way, I end up with points at 0, q, 1, and infinity. Hmm? Now, actually, yeah. So I'm uh, describing the, the parameter space of a four-puncture sphere, of a sphere with four points, simply by putting three points at 0, 1, and infinity and moving around the fourth point. Uh, now, there is a useful fact to remember. So we wanted our parameter space to look like the upper half plane. Remember the upper half plane is what you get when you think about the commodular space of a torus. Uh, so now there is a very simple way to make a torus out of, four, of a four-puncture sphere. You can just write some equation, y squared with equal to a polynomial, which has zeros at those four points. So in this case, it's not like y squared equal to z, z minus 1, z minus q. So this defines an elliptic curve, a torus. And this torus has a certain modular parameter. Hmm? Uh, So uh, when you compare Q and Q prime or Q double prime corresponding to those three transformations, hmm, you find transformations like Q goes to 1 minus Q prime or Q goes to 1 over Q double prime. And when you convert these into statements about this tau, they become exactly as such z transformations. And these three patches of this sort uh, really coincide with, this, uh, with these three patches I was drawing here. Okay? So here I'm skipping some corners because I'm uh, not sure how much more time do I have. Uh, Okay, but this is an exact. This is a this is a useful exercise. You just uh, check in detail that uh, with this definition, these dualities are pretty natural. So, so we built out the whole space out of basic S duality transformations. Uh, maybe I should also mention we said that uh, as you choose n equal four as duality should also be part of the game. Now, if you have a picture like this, that corresponds to taking a sphere and identifying zero and infinity, gluing together zero and infinity by the transformation z goes to qz. Uh, so essentially, in the z plane, you're building a torus by gluing together two circles of a nano. It's, it take a nanolar strip in the plane, and you glue the boundaries together to make a torus. So the sl z transformations of n equal 4 super mills, again, just the modular transformations of this torus. 
Okay. So uh, this is a, a very basic argument to, to justify the statement that the parameter space of the theory is really the parameter space of Riemann surface of genus G with n points. Now you could say, of course, we only explore the boundaries of this parameter space, and we made this conjecture. Now you really would like to make sure that as you go in, you will not find any more surprises. But at least the boundary of this space of Freeman surfaces and the boundary of the mod of parameter space of the theory look the same. And because complex geometry is rather rigid, you can at least hope that the, the parameter space will just be the same. Now, uh, the only way to really test that is to do things like uh, build, building the subvariant curve for these theories and checking the subvariant curve really depends appropriately on these parameters. So you need to be able to build the subvariant curve. I should say, you need to, let me say it better. You need to be able, given a point in the parameter space of Riemann surface genus G and a point, to produce the infrared Lagrangian of, the, of, the, of your gauge theory. And if the infrared Lagrangian behaves properly, then maybe you're in business. Uh, so you want to really be able to uh, take above each point the Coulomb branch of your theory and check that it's fibered properly and that it transforms properly under as dualities. I mean, all the parameters should transform properly under as dualities, and the charts that we gave should be, should be natural for the Coulomb branch. Now, uh, the Coulomb branch has dimension 3g minus 3 plus n, which happens to be the same as the dimension of your parameter space. This is no coincidence, because if you want to change a gauge coupling, you just need to, to change your Lagrangian by adding a prepotential term uh, this the expectation value of this operator is a parameter order parameter of your Coulomb branch Vice versa, every dimension true operator could be added to the Lagrangian to give you a coupling. So couplings in dimension true operators are one-to-one -one correspondence. And it's pretty clear from this four expression that ui delta tau i should be a one form. Should transform as a one form under whatever transformations of the gauge couplings you do. So that tells you how the Coulomb branch in different patches should be glued together. It should be glued together the same way as the cotangent bundle of Mg. So this is the natural uh, structure. Your Coulomb branch should be fibered around the parameter space the same way as the cotangent bundle of the parameter space itself, the cotangent bundle of Mgn. Now, how do, how do we check if this makes sense? Well, sure. So at every point in parameter space, the Coulomb branch is the cotangent bundle, is, is the fiber of the cotangent bundle. And if you change charts, uh, the U parameter should transform the same way as the one form does. So if tau goes to a function of taus, the U should be multiplied by the Jacobian of the transformation. Now, you might wonder why would, why would the U's get mixed together under S duality? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, if I do S duality at this node, why should the, be the other parameter of this gauge group affected at all? But again, we have to be careful. There is again a renormalization scheme ambiguity. Here you have a whole bunch of operators of dimension two. And you know that when you renormalize the theory, you, you cannot just 
to normalize each separately. You need to diagonalize your dilatation operator. Even if this theory is finite, you can still get finite renormalization that mixes these operators together. And as you go from weak to strong coupling in some parameter, the operators can end up mixing together. So now there is a very cute way to describe the cotangent bundle to the parameter space of a Riemann surface. First of all, you should, you should find a good way to describe the delta tau i's. So how do you change a little bit the parameters of a Riemann surface? Well, let's go back to this picture. How do I change a little bit one of the q's? Here I had glued with some q. Suppose I want to glue with a q plus delta q. Well, I cut and I glue back with a slightly different q. A useful way to say that is that I take some part of my Riemann surface, I take a part gamma ion on the surface, and I cut the surface along the path, and I glue it back after acting with a vector field, which is defining the neighborhood of, the, of, of gamma i. So if I'm given a path together with a vector field along the path, This gives me a way to change the complex structure of my surface. So I, um, so I, I really want to act on the points with the infinitesimal with the transformation delta tau i vi d over dz. Now I want to build something in the dual, something I could contract with these delta taus. <laughs> so how do I build something in the dual of this structure? Well, I have a part in the vector, in holomorphic vector fields. Well, suppose I, st I take a quadratic differential, which is a quantity uh, of this form where P transforms under coordinate transformations so to compensate for the transformations of Z. If I'm given this pair of a path and a vector field, I contract the, ve the local vector field with P and integrate the result on gamma. So if I'm given a small uh, movement along my, mo my parameter space, I can build out uh, a number out of P, uh, which, which is to say uh, that I could write a sensible equation of this form This equation will be, if I write this equation in a chart, it will automatically be true in other charts. So this is the chance of being an S-duality invariant way to package the information of these UIs. I just package them all together in a quadratic differential. And then I transform this quadratic differential with my coordinate transformations, and I read off the UIs again. Uh, now, there is only a little, uh, point I want to mention. So this, uh, a very simple, another very simple way I can change the complex structure of a surface, of course, is to move a point somewhere else, right? So how do, do I do that? Well, I cut and I glue back, shifting a little. So there is a very simple transformation when I have points on the Riemann surface where I take a path gamma which just goes around the point and which vector field do I get? Well, the vector field is just going to be day over z. So v is, z is 1. So if I want to have quadratic differential, which has non-trivial uh, inner product with this, with, uh, with this vector field, I want the integral of p, z, z along the point uh, to be non-zero. 
So P should be allowed to have poles, simple poles. So what is the parameter space? So what is the modular space of how many quadratic differentials with simple poles that end punctures on the Riemann surface of genus G? Well, uh, there is, you can use riemann rock theorem to show that there are exactly 3G minus 3 plus N. So the space of possible quadratic differentials really coincides with the dimension of my Coulomb branch. So it makes perfect sense to say that the, the Coulomb branch is really the space of quadratic differentials with simple poles. And this is the natural way to describe the cotangent bundle of, an, of the manifold. Actually, here, what I'm saying here is strictly speaking true when the mass parameters at the punctures are zero. Uh, with a little bit more work, I don't think it's worth to do it now, uh, you can argue that if you include mass parameters at some puncture, then uh, essentially P should have double poles at the puncture whose parameter are the mass parameters squared. And uh, again, this is a useful exercise. Uh, you, can you can see that this follows from self-consistency, from the requirement that if you uh, decouple the gauge group, the mass parameter for the resulting favor symmetry should coincide with the expectation value of the uh, vector multiple at the time decoupling. Anyway. So this is just a, a way to package the information of the Coulomb branch into a quadratic differential. Now I should give you the infrared Lagrangian. Well, let me call the curve C, this curve of genus G with 10 points. Let me consider, so C star of G is the two-dimensional complex manifold, has coordinates x, z, where z is a point in C. And x behaves is such that x dz is a one form. And let me write this, this equation, x squared equal to p. This equation makes sense because x dz was one form, so x squared dz squared is a quadratic differential. And I'm putting quadratic differential on the right-hand side. This defines a curve, sigma. I claim that this is the subordinate curve of the theory. So in part, in, 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 in the subordinate differential is exactly x dz. What that means is that if I take any path in sigma and I integrate x dz along that path, this will produce a certain function uh, which I identify with a central charge function of my theory. And uh, so, to, so this is my claim, that the infrared Lagrangian has this description. Now, how do you test this claim? Well, the most basic claim, is, the most basic test is that this should give you the correct weakly coupled, weak coupling description. So if I put all my taus to be weakly coupled and also I go at infinity in the Coulomb branch, so the theory is weakly coupled in the, in the V and in the IR. Then I should be able to recover the usual weakly coupled Lagrangian, which is something like uh, just A squared, a, a potential A squared. And uh, it just works. So. Uh, it's not difficult to show that if the, weak, if the gauge couplings are very weak, so that the Riemann surface consists of very long tubes, you see, then the, the subaviton curve also consists of long tubes that wrap twice these tubes and then mix together in complicated ways. Uh, in these intermediate regions. 
And then you can just take a path gamma, and just goes around the tube. Well, you lift it up here. But you get, just get a path gamma which goes around this tube. And you integrate x to z to define some AIs. And you can also show that there are, that if, so then if you take any other path with transverse this tube, goes around some branching point and comes back on the other sheet, we call this gamma dual i, and you define an a-dual, then, uh, a dual behaves like tau a plus one loop corrections, plus the expected one loop corrections, plus instantons. So you can show that in each and every of these weekly couple cusps, far away in the column branch, you reproduce uh, the results that you would have uh, found if you had just done the very careful weekly couple analysis that you saw in the first lecture in the first week. So you know, compute the, same, the classical uh, prepotential, compute the one loop corrections. Uh, sorry, compute the classical gauge coupling, the one loop correction to the gauge coupling, and uh, so uh, in just one one single equation we capture the, the infrared dynamics of all the theories made of SU2 gauge groups uh, and uh, this sort of fundamental matter, high fundamental matter. And, and so this then, of course, you can subject this, this conjecture to, to many tests. So you can take any, any of the tests that Saber and Witten did to, to their curves in, in paper one and two and apply them to this curve. And maybe we'll do some of those tonight in this extra lecture. Uh, uh, so you can look at how the Higgs branches of the theory behave. You can try to take various decoupling limits. And this seems to pass all the tests. And uh, I think now it's probably time to stop. <laughs>